I actually kind of like the fact that uh, it's not full. People were telling me that this was going to be standing room only. Um, for reasons that might become apparent, I'm actually delighted that uh, there's room to move. Um, uh, for me, uh, uh, as we kind of go into firing things up uh, in this conversation, um, uh, uh, my experience of conversations about uh, bike helmets uh, tend to use up a lot of oxygen. Um, and uh, uh, the conversations that I might want to have, that I think we might want to have about infrastructure, investment, education, programs, uh, place, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, tend to get uh, 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 missed because we focus on what I would call uh, uh, single, however important issues uh, like bike helmets. Um, so today, uh, this is my opportunity to suck up a little bit of that oxygen. Um, can I have uh, uh, just a, a quick show of hands of people in this room uh, who are in favour of mandatory helmet laws? Uh, and uh, can I have uh, uh, hands up for those who are against mandatory helmet laws? Uh, only one hand allowed over there. Uh, and and uh, those who, who uh, uh, have an open mind and might be prepared to change just a little bit. Uh, very good, because, uh, you know, listen, there's plenty of oxygen to go around. Uh, since 1990, um, uh, progressively uh, Australian states have adopted uh, mandatory helmet laws uh, and uh, everyone's got to wear a helmet to meet certain standards. There are exceptions if you've got medical reasons, uh, religious reasons uh, 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 or health reasons. Um, uh, you don't have to, but you have to carry a certificate to, to that effect. The exceptions to the, the Northern Territory, where if you're over 17, um, uh, you uh, don't have to wear a helmet if you're on a, a shared path, a bike path, uh, or, or effectively anywhere else the minister uh, decides uh, is exempt. Um, they do do things differently up north. Uh, my first helmet uh, was, uh, was not Molly's. It was a, uh, a big white bell contraption, no vents, uh, that I bought at a shop near here, um, in, uh, or my dad bought for me in the, um, in the early 80s. Um, and uh, uh, I, looking back at those photos now, I realise uh, why I was uh, not such a hit with the ladies, because uh, when you're a dorky teenager, having the Taj Mahal on your head uh, uh, doesn't really work. Um, but what the hell, uh, I was happy to wear it, uh, because uh, when, even when the boys, and it was always boys uh, who mocked my helmet, um, I felt that my brain was, uh, was safe. So that's intuitively, as a teenager, I kind of, I kind of got that. Uh, Last year, uh, uh, our, good, uh, our good fellow delegate uh, and, and main speaker, uh, uh, Mikhail Koval anderson uh, made the comment um, that uh, 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 the world has been pointing at Australia's uh, helmet laws uh, and laughing for the past 20 years. Uh, and, and to me, uh, well, I love Michael Dealey, uh, but to me that just... Uh, it sounds like the boys at high school who used to mock me. Um, uh, yesterday, you might have heard Niels. He um, was talking about people walking into a store wearing a helmet, parking their bike outside a store and walking to a, 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 parking their bike outside a store and walking inside with a helmet. And he used the word silly. And I was kind of, really? I experienced my first epiphany uh, about helmets. Um, uh, when I was reading an article about sex in a gentleman's magazine uh, in the UK many years ago, a, a magazine called Arena. It was a, a, a glossy with lots of important, useful content, you know, a fashion magazine. Um, and they'd done a, a survey of their readership and they'd asked them about their sexual habits. Uh, and uh, 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 it was all really interesting. But um, it struck me uh, as, as why do I want to know what... Uh, whether the average time, number of times that a UK couple have sex in a month, what relevance is that to me? How is that important? Um, uh, I would uh, suggest that uh, really uh, what everyone else does um, just doesn't matter. The real survey that matters is the one between me and my partner and, and, and what we as individuals do. Uh, and what every, everyone else does is kind of irrelevant. Um, today, uh, this morning, uh, you'll hear um, uh, some really powerful arguments uh, for, possibly in favour, uh, uh, possibly against, uh, mandatory helmet laws. Um, uh, these are serious research analyses, uh, lots of uh, 
serious research, lots of data, uh, lots of stats, uh, really powerful. Um, you might characterise it as, uh, I was going to say Manfred, but I'll, I'll say Ian, and I don't want to steal his thunder, but you know, later on he'll, he'll talk about mandatory helmet laws, failed, failed policy, uh, has a detrimental effect on, on the numbers of riders, uh, and there's a consequential health loss to, uh, con consequential cost to, uh, to our health, uh, to, to transport, to congestion, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, meanwhile, here uh, in South Australia, our own um, Dr Bill Griggs, who's um, head of trauma at the hospital, uh, argues that you know, helmets protect your head from serious trauma, serious brain injury, uh, and that the statistics uh, are, 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 are not entirely accurate. So that's his perspective. Now, my perspective uh, is that um, both, both parts of that end of that conversation are, are, are valid. Um, and you could find research, uh, lots of research, absolutely to support either argument. Um, to me, uh, the research uh, uh, suggests one thing, but I think there's another way that we can actually look at, um, uh, uh, take another perspective um, to these two opposing views. Um, like the magazine survey, the sex, the, the, the sex survey, uh, what matters is not what everyone else is doing. What matters uh, uh, is uh, what, um, what we as individuals choose to do. So the stats might tell us one thing, but ultimately it's us who need to choose what we do. Now, um, uh, while we have the choice about how we need to behave, what I'm not saying uh, is that you have the individual choice to wear or not to wear a helmet here, because in Australia you don't have a choice. Well, it is the law. Um, but uh, I would argue that uh, instead let's be inspired by the individuals who embrace the wearing of a helmet uh, as an ordinary, normal, everyday part of their bike riding outfit. Uh, Colville Anderson said, uh, I don't ride in cities uh, that, uh, uh, that have helmet laws. That's absolutely fine, uh, but instead can we be inspired uh, by those individuals who actually do it uh, and just then get on with it. For me, uh, uh, that's a much more constructive, evolved way of thinking. Um, uh, recently, Australia's uh, 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 Attorney General argued that uh, in a free country, um, uh, people do have rights to say things that other people find offensive. Uh, uh, the government, as you may know, is proposing changes to the Racial Discrimination Act um, with its protections for individuals or groups of people from being offended, insulted, humiliated or intimidated to defend against incitement to hatred and vil vilification. Now, I'm not sure with, uh, I agree with media, re media uh, references um, to the struggle between cyclists and motorists being akin to apartheid, um, but it isn't it the case that um, uh, in, uh, getting insulted and intimidated and vilified uh, is par for the course for many cyclists on our roads every day. Uh, the media love uh, are cyclists versus, versus motor stories. Um, l last month, uh, a magazine published this headline, Are, are Cyclists Fair Game? Um, uh, so uh, we're responsible for that. What have we created with our labels, uh, with our tribes? Um, last uh, Saturday, the paper uh, talked about um, uh, different types of cyclists, um, the corporate cadels, uh, the family peloton, the car-hating hippies, the mad inventors, the, uh, the mountain mani maniacs, the, the espressos, we've got cycle chic, uh, we've got a lot of mi middle-aged men in Lycra in Adelaide. Um, uh, even the term cyclist, um, uh, you know, g'day, I mean, my name's Michael and I'm a motorist. Uh, uh, my name's Michael and I'm a pedestrian. Uh, uh, you know. Do I say, my name's Michael and I'm a, a cyclist? Well, no, really. Uh, today, I'm just uh, a guy who rides a bike. Um, and uh, I kind of tend to avoid the cyclist one. Uh, we're a multicultural society and we're proud to be that. Um, uh, but cyclists, are, 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 we have not evolved, though, to, to uh, embrace all forms of transport equally. Um, uh, cyclists are ghettoised, uh, we're forced to the periphery. But instead of confronting this bigotry, I would argue, uh, we tend to focus on, uh, and we spend an inordinate amount of time uh, uh, arguing the pros and cons of, of things like bike helmets. Uh, now, when you, are, uh, when you highlight um, the peculiarities of our different styles, uh, to me that's not far removed uh, from mocking uh, an individual or a nation for wearing helmets. Um, so instead, can we imagine a future where helmets are normal? 
Uh, what if we accepted helmets as, we, as an everyday, unremarkable part of our attire? Uh, no more exceptional than wearing a pair of shoes. Uh, now, in this country, all you need to ride a bike uh, is a bicycle and a helmet. That's it, nothing more. Uh, when you point at us and you point at me and you challenge our rules to wear a helmet, uh, you call us silly, uh, you diminish us all uh, and uh, you simply feed the bike haters. Uh, for the Australians uh, who vehemently uh, dislike um, uh, the helmet laws, and there are many in this room, um, I can't offer you any comfort. I really can't. Um, but I can say that you will always be frustrated and unhappy um, because you want something that you don't have, which is choice. Um, you can choose a black helmet, you can choose a pink one, and you can choose a spotty one. You can even choose one with Go Faster stripes, but you can't choose not to wear one. Um, and that's okay, but uh, 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 you could choose actually to be happy, uh, I suggest, by simply moving on, uh, and for me, focusing on the important stuff. Um, as bike riders, I think our true rate of progress is not measured by quick, how quickly we get to uh, A to B, but how evolved we are in our thinking. Uh, now, um, I'm inspired by those people who embrace the bike helmet. Uh, uh, the sartorial possibilities are endless, uh, and I love that. I, I, I really uh, acknowledge and appreciate their chutzpah, their attitude, their verve. Um, and uh, my view is, is, is people who value their helmets, uh, they're happy and they smile easily. Uh, I think, you know, people who wear helmets, well, the people I know, they smile easily. Uh, my second epiphany um, uh, that I had uh, recently on my commute into the city uh, was um, uh, when I was riding down the main street and there was a queue of cyclists uh, crossing the road uh, and at the head of the queue was a woman uh, who uh, uh, was, uh, absolutely stopped me in my tracks. Uh, she was um, uh, 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 in a, a, uh, dressed in a, in a polka dot dress, she had high heels, uh, her nails were just so, she had red lipstick, she looked uh, absolutely stunning and she was sitting there on her bike waiting to cross the road uh, and she was just leaning on her handbars, handlebars and, and completely in her own world she was just drawing, uh, having a, a really long drag on her cigarette. And I was absolutely stunned. To me, uh, she was the most complete, confident bike rider I had ever seen. Uh, uh, and what was really interesting to me was that she didn't look fantastic despite her bike helmet, she looked fantastic because of her bike helmet. She, it made her complete, it matched her outfit. She looked a million bucks and she knew she looked a million bucks. And I really thought that that was fantastic. Here was a woman who was saying, if, I was gonna, if I'm gonna have, uh, wear a helmet, I might as well uh, uh, make it work for me. Um, uh, so I was talking to someone uh, recently who said, uh, you might as well make it uh, uh, look good on yourself. And I think that's really inspired, that's kind of brilliant, uh, a brilliant approach to, to uh, this, really, uh, this issue. Uh, now, in conclusion, uh, uh, Peter Allen, uh, and you've got to bear with me on this one. Um, uh, I had a third, uh, my third epiphany recently on a, on a street near here. There's a laneway just off Hindley Street. Uh, there's a car park uh, and there's some public artwork. Uh, and often uh, blokes late at night will go down there and, and, and cause trouble, uh, if you like. Um, now, local authorities, I think it's probably the council, they identified this space as a bit vulnerable to theft or vandalism or worse. And their inspired solution is not to limit access or invest in barriers, but simply to play amplified music. Uh, and to me, don't you just love Peter Allen's I Go To Rio? Uh, it's fun, it's catchy, it gets the toes tapping, and it's perfect for clearing out a car park at three o'clock in the morning. The point is the authorities uh, uh, acted to prevent a potential problem. Rather than battling against a dark and negative space, they filled it with something wonderful and positive. Maybe this could work for us with bike helmets. Instead of wearing ourselves out by complaining about what we don't want, wouldn't it be better if we had a introduced a positive outlook about what we do want? Rather than say, should I or shouldn't I? Uh, because in Australia you do. How about instead we save ourselves a lot of grief and uh, make our bike helmets work for us, uh, embrace it, love it, uh, see it as part of our cycling DNA. Uh, and let's focus on uh, all the other bigger, important issues that get more people on bikes. Um, uh, to me, wouldn't it be fantastic if one day we can see uh, uh, catwalk models walking down the catwalk, looking spectacular with helmet hair. And I want to go into a barber shop and I want to say, give me helmet hair. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Great. Well, thanks very much, Michael. That was a somewhat slightly tongue-in-cheek sort of presentation of some of the issues and 
and I, I appreciate your, your attempted joviality there. Um, I, I guess I'm a little concerned about the, you know, it's, it's still a policy issue and we still have choice and in this country, even though you seem to suggest we, we shouldn't have any choice. And, and, and I think the, um, you know, if all the government can offer us is to make us potential victims defend ourselves by a thing on our heads, but without providing infrastructure and an environment that actually makes it safer for us to cycle, then I think the policy is failed because it's not actually delivering for us an environment that we can cycle safely in. If all we have to do is protect ourselves, there's, the, the government is actually abrogating their responsibility to make it easier for us to cycle. So I'm going to talk about four main things. Firstly, just talk a bit about you know, the riskiness of cycling because to justify mandatory legislation, you've got to have a very risky situation. It's got to be dangerous. I'm going to talk a little bit about the efficacy of helmets, but not going into too much detail with that, but there's some serious problems with the evidence, as Michael actually said, about the evidence that supports uh, helmets. The effectiveness of the legislation is the key of all of this in terms of how it does prevent injuries, head injuries, and there's no question at all that there has been a negative impact on cycling participation, and I don't think there's sort of almost any dissent really around that. So first point really is not all cycling has the same risk. Some sports activities are particularly risky, but it's not the same level of risk if you're just sort of tootling along a bike path or through a park or recreational to some of the more risky activities. So mandatory legislation for everyone at all times is a really blunt policy instrument. There's plenty of evidence that the benefits of cycling actually outweigh the risk. Most of that is health benefits in terms of physical activity and the prevention of chronic diseases and things like that. And there have been some really solid and consistent reports that have, have, have articulated that. What we now have as well is all the evidence from the bike share programs. And Janet Khan yesterday talked about the New York program. Millions of kilometres cycled thousands, hundreds of thousands of hours cycled, cycled, and the injury and crash rates are, are minuscule. The, 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 the paranoia that is created around cycling in Australia, that it's such a dangerous activity, isn't borne out across the world in the injury rates that we now have from exposure studies. So exposure-based studies is important because you can, you know, you're not just counting who falls over, but it's relative to how exposed they are to its cycling itself, so how long and how far you ride. And I've been involved in a particular study at the University of New South Wales, the Safer Cycling Study, where we've actually done this prospectively in New South Wales. We recruited 2,038 cyclists, studied them over a 12-month period, six weeks intervals of, through the year, and we collected data covering something like 30,000 hours of cycling and 682,000 kilometres. So we've got some exposure now of cyclists in, this, in, in, in New South Wales. In the study period, the weeks we defined, we had 198 crashes. 50% of them were falls by themselves. So, you know, slipped on a bit of, you know, uh, slippery leaves or grass, metal plate, whatever, and, and the other half were, were contact with, crap, with other bikes or cars, mostly cars. So the, that works out to be an exposure rate, a crash rate, per million kilometres of something like 290, and the actual injuries requiring medical, medical attention are, are about 23. Now, so what does that mean? You know, like, that doesn't seem like, you know, that's, they're just numbers. We've got to compare it to something else. And so what we've got is uh, there are only four other studies around the world that have done similar sort of work. And they're not the same, they're different time frames, they've asked slightly different questions, they've counted the medical things differently. But what you can see, broadly speaking, is that Australian risk of cycling isn't any different to Canada or Belgium, at least in the studies that we've been able to access. So the risk of cycling in Australia is no different from anywhere else. So the imperative to protect us isn't, is no different. There have been particular studies that have looked at the health benefits of mandatory helmet legislation. A recent one just came out in Germany, and they've pretty much concluded that it's not worth, it's, it's actually a deficit. It's actually costing us, us more money with helmet legislation because of the loss of health benefits. These hinge around participation in cycling, 
but they're really conservative. They estimate something like, you know, if, if there was a 5% reduction in, in, in participation in cycling, what would the cost effect be? And that's really conservative because the data will tell you in Australia that the participation, drop, participation rate dropped by about 30 to 40%. And so it's, it's kind of clear that the introduction of helmet legislation has sort of a, a fairly obvious cost reduction or cost benefit reduction. And I've got a cute little cartoon here, because this is sort of sums it up in a way. The little girl is being approached by the big lady in the car. And, and the point is, you know, she, she's not doing us any favours by sitting in her car and getting overweight. OK, so let's, now let's just talk a little bit. I'm not going to dwell on this a lot, but it's just worth looking at that there's a hierarchy of evidence in medical research. And, you know, it all goes from, you know, just anecdotes and stories that we swap to kind of massive randomised controlled trials and meta-analyses and, and systematic reviews and things like that. But what is, what, a, what is true is that most of the studies on helmet efficacy are, are case control studies. And they're typically defined as hypothesis generating. They're just sort of looking at possible scenarios. They're not causal. They're not, they're not, they don't really explain all the, all the evidence. And there are massive problems with case control studies where you can actually come up with the opposite answer. One of the early case control studies looked at heart, uh, hormone replacement therapy and heart disease, and they said it was protective. But when they did a cohort study and followed up people over time, the opposite result was actually found. There are all sorts of methodological problems that come into, into case control studies, and they don't always study the things that are necessarily important, like how fast were the riders going, were they drinking, you know, risk compensation issues. So you've got, there are some question marks really about you know, how firm the evidence is that helmets are really protective. And then what, what's happened is that these, there has been Cochrane re reviews, which are meant to be the gold standard of all evidence, but the ones for helmets were actually done by the people that did the case control studies. So they reviewed their own work and concluded that of course it was effective. And other people have looked at it and, and sort of challenged that and Elvik Rune's written this beautiful paper which actually says, wait a minute, if you really look at this sort of objectively, there's massive bias in what you've just done. And at best, there's a 15% reduction in, in injuries related to helmets. Now, that's probably right. There, you know, it will, helmets will protect some head injuries and I don't think there's sort of disagreement about that in terms of the scrapes and contusions and bumps that you might get. But it isn't necessarily gonna save you from the, 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 the severe traumatic brain injury, which is probably the really scary thing. And then even if people did have helmets and they were beautiful colours and they were pink and yellow and red, they have to wear them properly. And there's so many kids or beginners and also, you see it all the time, don't you? You know, people do, haven't got their helmet on properly. And so if they were to fall, it wouldn't really help them. And so when you look at injury rates and crashes and stuff like that, it kind of harshly explains why the helmet legislation isn't really effective in practice. And there's lots of reasons why it doesn't work and, and there are different ways of, uh, of looking at, at helm, beha user behaviour, basically. So let's go to the data. Let's look at what actually happened in New South Wales over time. And what you've got there is three different modes. It's a little unclear, I apologise for that. But the, um, it's the dotted, the, the dotted line which is the cycling rate. Now, what, what the pro-helmet legislation advocates have done has said they've looked at, at that point and that one and said, right, the legislation came in through the middle of that period and look, there's been a massive drop, okay? And that is true. If you look at it that statistically, it is a, a significant drop. What that shows also is that at the same period, there was a reduction in injuries and casualties for pedestrians and motor vehicle users. So how can helmet legislation explain that? And truthfully, they also acknowledged that the changes in infrastructure and the environment around uh, road use changed during that period, and that actually benefited all road users. So the likely impact of helmet legislation is modest at best. And what you've got here as well is that you've got fewer injuries in cyclists because people stop riding at that time because of the impact of legislation. So that partially explains the drop as well. So the, there isn't strong evidence here that the helmet legislation necessarily was the, uh, was the cause of the reduction in those injuries among cyclists. Let's look at Western Australia, and Ian will probably show you this graph as well, and what it is is percentage of head injuries related to all sorts of injuries by different road users. And again, 
across all road user types, you've got a reduction before the legislation was introduced. So, you, and this is the thing I've been saying for quite a while, is that all these changes were occurring before the legislation came in, which was really at the tail end of a whole series of road safety kind of um, initiatives. You could argue here that the helmet legislation actually stopped the improvement in cycling benefits. So the evidence isn't looking too good for the legislation having achieved these benefits. So here's mortality rates for cyclists across the country since 1950. And again, you've got this steady decline if you use mortality as a proxy of injuries. And yes, there was a big sort of advanced drop around the 1990 point, partially because people stopped riding at that point. But to just focus on that particular section of the data and not consider the overall and longer term trends is to misrepresent what was actually happening. And I think the fair assessment of what's happened here is that there were many changes in the road environment that were collective over time that contribute to improvements in Australian road safety for cyclists. It's not just in Australia. John Puka and others have looked at these sorts of the mortality rates in five different countries across the world over the same sort of time period, and you have exactly the same trend. They do not have helmet legislation, so that cannot be the answer for the reduction in cycling mortality in these five different countries. So I'm thinking it's not the legislation that has made these big improvements for cycling in Australia. What, actually, what happened, what, what it means for us in Australia is, of course, there was a reduction in, in cyclist participation and we go down to changing the, the culture of, us, of, of, of cycling. And so we lose all the, the everyday casual cyclists, who, the people who don't think of themselves as cyclists. And we've now got a scenario where we go from, you know, everyone riding around on bikes, women, to the, you know, the sports peloton, and we've talked about that during the, the, you know, the, the conference today, that the culture of cycling in Australia is still very sports focused, and, and that excludes people from thinking of themselves as, as wanting to hop on a bike or thinking they don't identify themselves as cyclists. And why would they? Why would you want to? Lots of people are turned off by the whole sort of lycra, lycra image. Now, I showed this picture yesterday in the spin cycle thing around sort of skills courses. And of course, in Australia, the older woman in this picture would be fined by the police. And it didn't just happen in Australia. When New Zealand introduced their legislation, again, the black line there is the decline in participation. And their data is actually much better than ours. And what they also saw at the same time was an increase in the injury rates for cyclists. And this is in proportion to um, safety in numbers with cycling, so that when you lose cyclists, it actually becomes more dangerous. And so that is exactly the same scenario that happened in New Zealand. So it's not a one-off effect. And I spoke to a guy from Taiwan ye yesterday, we talked about this, and, and they said, well, we weren't going to introduce helmet legislation for the bike share scheme, because they reviewed the literature internationally, and they concluded that the, the benefits for injury protection just weren't there. So I think other countries are looking at these data and sort of saying, well, it, it, yeah, why would you? And so then, has that stopped? Are, are we over it? Are we used to it? Are we embracing the helmet now? And in fact, cycling participation in Australia is flat. This is census data for journey to work, and the only place it's gone up is Canberra, or ACT, and they've built lots of infrastructure. So infrastructure is probably the answer to getting more people cycling and more people cycling safety, safer. And if that's, that's the distorted scale, we're talking just the bottom 3%. If you look at that across the whole 100%, it's a flat line. We have got no improvement in cycling. People think there's been a big increase in cycling in, in the cities and all the rest of it. And I've done lots of analyses in Sydney about you know, where people are increasing cycling. And yes, there are statistically significant increases in the inner city areas, but in the outer rings, in the suburban areas, cycling's going down. And that's where all the people are. So, accumulatively, there is no increase in cycling in Australia. We need a quantum shift here in terms of how we, we approach getting more people cycling. Helmets are a barrier. People will tell you that they are a barrier. Not everyone, certainly not the Lycra people who, you know, it's part of the uniform. Put on the cleats, got the kit on, got the gloves, got the glasses, got the helmet. It's part of the, 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 the uniform. 
But for people who don't think of themselves as cyclists, it's a barrier. And people have been telling us about one in five consistently saying that, they're trying to wind me up, um, that is a barrier. And I did a survey in Sydney of about 600 people, um, cross-sectional market research sort of thing, and we asked them, would you cycle more if you didn't have to wear a helmet? And we got about 23% of them who said that they would ride more. And importantly, about one in five, 20 percent, 90 percent of the non-riders, the people who do not ride, who haven't ridden in a year, said that they would. And that turns into a massive number when you do the figures. In Sydney, that's about, you know, 19 percent of 2.1 million people. That's 400,000 riders that we don't have that are deterred. And that's, all, you know, okay, sure, okay, maybe, maybe not 20 percent, maybe 5 percent. That would still be 100,000 more people cycling in Sydney at least some time. And the, in Sydney, about 15,000 people ride to work on census day. So we're talking quantum shifts of people getting on bikes who don't normally ride. So to, sum, to finish, there is potentially a massive increase in cycling if we get rid of the legislation. Some of the people, half the people would wear a helmet anyway, and that's fine, people can make a choice. And I think um, the interesting observation here is that the people who really support helmet legislation are the ones who don't cycle. So I don't think there's much evidence here. I think it's got a negative impact and, um, you know, let's, let's, let's move on from that. And I'd say let's do what was recommended in Queensland. Let's do a trial. Let's actually study what happens. Let's have a jurisdiction, try re relaxing the helmet legislation and seeing what impact it does have on injuries and participation and we can move on to a, so a better cycling environment. So, thank you. Michael mentioned uh, making helmets work for us, and that's fine for those who are happy to wear a helmet, but there's an awful lot of people out there who either don't want to wear a helmet or don't want to be forced to wear a helmet, and there are two slightly different uh, issues. And this presentation is about how many of those people have stopped cycling and why they've stopped cycling. Now, I come from uh, a, policy, a public policy background, uh, basically, uh, and public policy in Australia is going through a tough time at the moment. Once upon a time, we used to have evidence-based policy, or at least policy that was informed by <coughs> evidence. But ideology creeps in. We have evidence-free policy, Mandatory helmet laws are an example of that. There was no analysis that I'm aware of before the event. It was simply that the then Federal Minister for Transport said to the states, you will introduce mandatory helmet laws, otherwise you won't get other road safety funding, which is a bit Irish, if you'll excuse the expression. But we now have a whole series of what I call evidence-denying policies, of which uh, climate change is the most obvious one, particularly at the federal level. Uh, and mandatory, mandatory helmet laws now fit into that category as well because it is virtually impossible to get consideration, serious consideration of mandatory helmet laws and the evidence surrounding those uh, in, in the uh, policy arenas. I, uh, at the risk of offending anybody here, I approached the WA Department of Transport and uh, at least a couple of areas in there and said, how can we get this on the agenda now that we've got the evidence? And they basically said, well, don't come through us. So they've become policy protectors, not policy developers and, uh, and evaluators. So if governments won't respond to evidence, what do we do? Well, I guess I've got to the stage in my life where I can do the, uh, the Don Quixote bit and, uh, and tilt at windmills. And there's a few of us have got together on, on that basis that if you don't enunciate the reasons for doing something for change, then it won't happen. So, our goal is primarily to get something happening, to get some inquiry, particularly a parliamentary <coughs> inquiry, not just into helmets, but into the whole issue of cycling and cycle safety uh, in Western Australia. Fundamentally, what's the problem? Uh, part of the problem uh, is that um, head injuries that would be um, ameliorated by helmets are actually not the majority of injuries that cyclists uh, have. And yet, that's what we focus on in the public, public policy sense at, at the moment. And focusing on, on that 10% or so of injuries, 
distracts attention from the other means of improving cyclist safety. Uh, this chart here is the funding requirements for the 1996 Perth uh, Bicycle Network Plan. Uh, that line obviously includes inflation. And the bars are the actual level of funding. So we did a good job at getting stage one funded. And that was partly because we arranged to get um, the, a predecessor to this conference to, to Fremantle in 1996. And the Premier had to stand up and open the conference and make some uh, grand pronouncement about what the state was doing for cycling. Uh, but after that, it, it went away. Uh, the result is that less than half of that network has actually been constructed so far. It's piecemeal, it's disconnected, uh, it serves some areas much better, uh, better than others. So it's a distraction. Secondly, they've reduced the level of cycling activity. And that is not only to the detriment of those who are deterred from cycling, but it's also to the detriment of those who continue to cycle. And I'll come, come back to that. And as a policy person, I see some huge problems th that this is simply at one example of, that there's no effective way to have an issue debated when politicians and bureaucrats are in denial. So there's a broader public policy issue in Australia and in many other places that needs to be addressed. Now, helmet laws don't exist in isolation. They exist in a very complex context. And I apologise for the, uh, uh, the difficulty in reading that in, in, in this forum. But basically, you've got a number of factors relating to the intrinsic effects of helmets. And, and Chris uh, gave some information uh, in respect to those. But you've also got a whole lot of factors relating to the, uh, the effect of compulsory helmets. And if we look at what is generally considered in most helmet debates, it's over here on this side of the intrinsic effects on helmets. So if you have a crash in your, when you're riding a bike, does the helmet provide some level of, of, of protection? That's an issue of, as a cyclist, is it beneficial to me to wear a helmet? There's a whole host of issues over here that are to do with the broader effects, the broader societal effects, and they go well beyond health. Uh, and whilst Chris emphasised the, the health benefits, there are even greater benefits in other areas of transport than, uh, than in health. But just looking at a couple of uh, the ones on the intrinsic effects side in, in the first instance, uh, one of the issues, and I say this as somebody who lives in a hot place in, in, in Perth, um, is heat stress, which is both an objective and a subjective factor. Now, the objective studies do appear to show there's no greater heat build-up when you're wearing a, a, a well-designed and well-ventilated well uh, helmet. And that raises issues of uh, design standards and so on. But it is very apparent that people do perceive that helmets are uncomfortable in warmer conditions. And if you look at the, uh, the journey to work, uh, over a long period of time, as recorded in the, in the census, then you see that the biggest reduction around the time of the mandatory helmet laws uh, and the slowest recovery since then has been in the three hottest capital cities. And I exclude Darwin for reasons that Chris uh, mentioned, because the laws are, are rather different there. And those three hottest cities are Perth, Brisbane and Adelaide. Uh, this is, this is correlation rather than necessarily causation, but my argument is the, the overall picture it is so consistent that it does verge on, uh, on causation. There's the issue of risk compensation. Both risk taking by cyclists, and there's, there's evidence that cyclists who are wearing a helmet will ride faster, and therefore, in the event they have a crash, the impact is potentially greater. But there's also risk taking by motorists. And there's evidence that motorists pass closer, generally, to a cyclist who's wearing a helmet than one who is not. And that's on the basis, not unreasonably, that in most situations, somebody who's wearing a helmet is probably a more experienced cyclist. But if everybody's forced to wear a helmet, that, that visual clue disappears, and the, uh, the, uh, the passing gap uh, narrows. 
Now, that may be ameliorated by the, uh, the campaign for a one metre passing uh, distance. It might not. So are compulsory helmets actually a barrier uh, to cycling? Well, Chris mentioned um, this sort of figure here, that 20, about 27% in, in, in WA say that having to wear a helmet is a negative influence on their uh, uh, cycling intentions. But there's also a whole host in, in other areas too where perceived safety is the thing that causes them not to cycle. And perceived safety is negatively affected by being told that if you cycle, you have to protect yourself because it's so dangerous. In terms of the broader areas of usage, there's broad agreement that there was an immediate reduction of around 30 or 40%. There's disagreement about what happened since then. And part of that's due to paucity, uh, paucity of evidence and to some extent, uh, conflicts in it. I apologise for the, uh, that's shifted slightly. Um, but there is evidence from WA that it clearly disproportionately discourages low risk cycle users. It also comes from other places too. And that the recovery, not just from in journey to work, but in, in other areas too, has been remarkably slow. And in fact, as Chris mentioned, in outer areas, it may still be declining. Since 1986, the bicycle mode share in Perth has gone down from 5.2% of trips to 1.7. That's a two-thirds reduction. And means that, in practice, there are probably fewer cyclists wearing helmets out there on the road than there were before the laws in the absolute numbers, which is an absolutely incredible conclusion when you look at it. Now that problem was identified in WA quite, quite early on. That uh, dates from the 1996 Bike Ahead uh, strategy. And you can see the, the trend in cyclist numbers and cycling participation has uh, at least flattened off, if not uh, started to drop. Uh, that's the travel survey information from Perth. So it went from 3.1% in 1976 to 5.2% in 1986 and down to 1.7% in 2006. Um, changes in the types of trips, but because it's within such a small, as, uh, within a smaller total number of trips, uh, what you find is that most trip types have actually suffered a huge reduction uh, in WA. Work trips have more or less stood up uh, in, in total numbers, but not in terms of uh, being relative to population, because uh, Perth's population has been growing quite, quite rapidly. And it's the utility trips, the trip to school, the trip to shopping, uh, and, and even the, sort of the social trip component uh, that's in that other as well. So it's broad-based. That's what's happened in terms of the journey to work. It went from 1.57% in 1991, dropped right down to 1%, and it's not yet got back to that 1991 level. And that's despite the fact that in the inner urban areas there has been an increase, measured increase, rapid increase in cycling. So is that three? Okay. Um, there's the safety in numbers effect. Now, the converse of the safety in numbers effect means that um, those who continue to cycle are exposed to higher risks than they, than they previously had. So people point to the risks of cycling. Chris uh, gave some information uh, on that. But the health benefits from cycling for an individual uh, are up to uh, four times the, uh, the, the crash risk. Uh, but it's also an issue of social inclusion or exclusion. The major reduction in cycling activity in Perth, at least, uh, has been in those social short distance utility trips. But there's also a huge disbenefit in terms of the transport system uh, as well. 
I won't uh, go through that first part because Chris covered that, but if you look at the benefits from cycling, 20% uh, are health benefits and 75% are really what you might call hardcore transport economic benefits. And that's the sort of thing that ought to impress our current um, right-wing governments because that's their agenda. These are real resources that are being used in transport um, that would not be used if you had more people cycling. The selective law enforcement. We had this crazy situation uh, in, in Perth only a few months ago where car drivers were driving along the shared path in order to avoid the traffic congestion. The police did absolutely nothing about that, but they stop and find people for, um, for not wearing a helmet. It, it's quite likely that having compulsory helmets uh, inhibits innovation because if you have a compulsory standard, it has to be much more stringently applied than if you have a voluntary uh, standard. So there are these types of helmets which are now uh, coming into, uh, into use in Europe. So the, to me, there's three key issues though. One is, is this in fact reversible? And however strongly we feel about mandatory helmet laws, we have to address that question because we've got a generation of non-cyclists who have been told that cycling is dangerous. And therefore, even if you remove the laws, they won't necessarily take it up. How achievable is it? Que um, Chris referred to the, uh, the Queensland experience where the minister immediately said no, because I believe helmet work, helmets work. He didn't address that third point there, which is the key issue of distinction between individual safety and population health. And that's a key issue. Thank you. There is an alternative in terms of getting things on the public policy agenda. Uh, I'm happy to talk outside this session uh, about that for anybody who wants to. Bottom line is we have a huge and demonstrable public policy problem in Australia which goes well beyond mandatory helmets, but mandatory helmet laws are a classic case thereof. Thank you.